In this video, we're going to talk about the idea of linear independence, we'll talk about basis sets, and we'll talk about matrix rank. We're going to start off, though, talking about the idea of a linear combination of vectors. The idea of a linear combination of vectors is that we scale vectors and then add them together. And we can get some intuition for this in 2D using directed line segments. Let's imagine, for example, that we have a vector, let's call it x, and another vector, let's call it y. These don't have to be uh, perpendicular or anything, but we could think about how we might create vectors that are blends of them, where the form of a vector might be, say, a little bit of x and a little bit of y. If A and B are positive, then maybe this is kind of pointing in the same direction, but of course they could also be, they could also be negative. They could make it longer, they could make it shorter, and so on. The point is that we're talking about linear combinations of X and Y. More generally, the idea is that in higher dimensional spaces, we still are just talking about linear sums. So in an arbitrary vector space, we could talk about a set of, say, K vectors. And let's say that each of these belongs to some vector space that will denote V. When we talk about a linear combination of these K vectors, then we're talking about all vectors of the form V equals some number, say, lambda times X1 plus, say, lambda, sorry, let's say lambda 1 times X1 plus lambda 2 times X2 and so on up to our kth vector. So each of these lambdas is some number that scales that x, and then we add them all together. And this is equivalent to this, but now in a more general vector space. We could also write this in a little bit more succinct form using the summation symbol. Say i equals 1 to k of lambda i multiplied by the vector xi. So this is a way to describe all of the linear combinations of this set of k vectors. If you want to describe the zero vector in this way, then you could just make all of the lambdas into zeros, right? Then it multiplies zero times x1, zero times x2, and so on, add together all of those zero vectors, and we get a zero vector. Now let's talk about the idea of linear dependence. Let's imagine that we have some vector space V. Let's imagine that we have a set of k vectors that are living in that space. Now, let's further imagine that we're going to consider linear combinations of these k vectors, just like we did a second ago. So linear combinations are of the form, say, sum v equals a sum from i equals 1 to k of some set of weights lambda multiplied by each of these vectors. So scale each of the vectors with lambda, add them all up, get a vector v. That's a linear combination. Now let's imagine that it's possible to find a situation, that is to find a set of lambdas, where this whole sum equals zero, and it's not just because all of the lambdas are equal to zero. So we're looking for a situation where this equals zero, but there exists at least one lambda i that is not equal to zero. So the easy way to make a zero vector is, of course, to have lambdas that are all zero. But let's imagine a situation where there is some lambda that is not zero, and yet we're still able to do a weighted sum and get zero out. And by the way, this is the zero vector. If we have that situation, this is what we call a linearly dependent set of vectors. If it's not true, if it's not possible to find such a set of lambdas, then the set of vectors is called linearly independent. As usual, it could be nice to think about linear dependence and independence in 2D. So let's imagine that we have a pair of vectors, say one and another one. Now clearly, no amount of scaling of one of these will allow me to make the other one. For just two vectors like this, linear dependence would mean that it should be possible to scale one of them to make the other. Clearly we can't do that in this situation, so we might say that these two vectors are linearly independent. On the other hand, in two dimensions, if we had two vectors, 
that say were just different magnitudes but otherwise the same, then clearly these would be linearly dependent because we could scale one to make the other. And then as another example, if we had, say, three vectors in two dimensions, even if they're not overlapping, we can pretty easily convince ourselves that probably we could construct one of these from the other two with the appropriate weights. And so they would be linearly dependent. There's some special cases to think about that are useful. If I have a set of vectors and two of them are identical, then clearly that set will be linearly dependent. I could take, say, a lambda of one for one of them and a lambda of negative one for the other and make all of the other lambdas zero. Those two guys would cancel out. I get the zero vector, but all my lambdas are not zero, right? So if I have two identical vectors, then clearly they're going to be linearly dependent. Similarly, if any of these guys is zero, if any of them is a zero vector, then it's also going to be a linearly dependent set. You can convince yourself of that because of course I could put some non-zero lambda on the zero vector, make all the other ones zero, and I would satisfy these conditions. Checking for linear dependence in a particular set of vectors can be done via Gaussian elimination. You make a matrix, in which each of the vectors is a column, and you try to put it into row echelon form with Gaussian elimination. If after you do that, there is any column that doesn't have a pivot in it, then that means it's a linearly dependent set of vectors. Let's look at an example. Let's imagine that we have, say, two and four and one as a vector, and five and negative one and two. Now we'll choose a third one to make sure that we have a linearly dependent set. And we're just gonna do that by imagining that it's just the sum of the others. Now if you're just eyeballing it, you might not necessarily see that these are linearly dependent vectors. But let's do Gaussian elimination. We'll start out with saying R2 minus 2R1, and we'll say R3 gets 2R3 minus R1. So, we keep the top row, 2, 5, 7. Now we get a 0 and negative 1 minus 10, negative 11, 3 minus 14, negative 11. And then down here we get a 0 and 4 minus 5, negative 1, and 6 minus 7 is negative 1. Now we can see we're probably in trouble here. Now to do this last one, we're going to say that we're going to make R3 probably gets 11 times R3 plus R2. When we do that, we're going to be in bad shape. We get 2, 5, 7, 0, negative 11, negative 11, and then 0, 0, 0. So this tells us that this set of vectors is linearly dependent, which is a thing we knew by construction, but you can see that we were able to verify it with Gaussian elimination. One important concept is the idea of a generating set. Let's imagine that we have a vector space as usual, let's call it V, and it is going to be composed of set and our two operations. Now let's imagine that we have some subset of V. Let's call that U. And this subset, so this is some set of vectors, and we could imagine all the possible linear combinations. U is a generating set of V if all V in set can be written as linear combinations of u. So it is a generating set. There might be many generating sets that we could have that would be able to give us v. A generating set of v is a set such that there's some linear combination of the vectors in u that would allow us to reach anywhere in v. A very related topic or concept is the idea of a span and a span is just kind of looking at things the other way. So the span set of vectors reachable as linear combinations of a set. So vectors that are linear combinations of the vectors in U. So we would call that the span of U. So this brings us to the very important concept of a basis. This is a word we've already used in a couple of previous videos. Again, let's imagine that we have some vector space as before, V composed of a set and our operations. So let's imagine that we have a generating set, U 
v. Again, that means that for every vector in v, it's possible to construct it via a linear combination of the members of u. Now, we would call this a minimal generating set if there are not any sets that can generate v that are smaller than u. So we're going to say if v has no smaller generating sets. Now it might be the case that there are a lot of minimal generating sets that are all the same size, but it's only minimal if there are none smaller. And here by smaller, smaller is in terms of the number of vectors in the set. So you can intuitively think about something being minimal as being the idea that somehow it's not redundant. There's nothing extra in it. It's exactly what we need in order to be able to generate V. Otherwise, it would be possible to generate V with a smaller set. And so that must mean, if there's none of this sort of redundance between the vectors, that the set of vectors is linearly independent. So a minimal generating set is a linearly independent generating set. And this is exactly this kind of concept of redundance. Linear independence means that it's not possible to construct any vectors in the set from a linear combination of other vectors in the set, and that also means that it's a minimal generating set. Minimal generating sets, we also call that a basis of V. So this is a basis. So a basis is a set of vectors that can't be smaller, but that allows you with a linear combination of those vectors to go anywhere in the vector space that you want. Bases are not unique, just like generating sets are not unique and minimal generating sets are not unique. You can have many bases for a vector space. However, for a fixed basis, every vector in the vector space can only be written as a unique combination of the basis vectors. And this arises kind of intuitively from the idea of linear independence. So bases are not unique. But in a basis, each vector in our vector space has a unique linear combination. That's a unique linear combination of the basis vectors. The idea of dimension is the number of basis vectors we need to span a vector space. So importantly, dimension may not refer to the number of entries in the vector, like the number of components that we see when we write the column vector. The dimension of a vector space is the number of basis vectors we need to capture that space. Now we can talk about the idea of matrix rank. If you imagine that we have some matrix and it has some number of columns and rows, and we were to look at the columns and think of those columns as being vectors. So this little matrix here would you know, have three vectors. Now let's think of these as being vectors, and let's think of the set of linear combinations that they might produce. The rank of a matrix is the number of linearly independent column vectors in that matrix. So if you can write one of the columns in terms of the other columns, then it is not going to be full rank. That is to say that there are not as many linearly independent columns as there are actual columns in the matrix. So the number of linearly independent columns is what we call matrix rank. The rank of a, the column rank, as we're saying of a matrix, is the same as its row rank notably. So if we were to imagine the transpose of this, that would also have the same rank as this matrix. A square matrix is only invertible if it is full rank. And when I say full rank, what I mean is that the rank is equal to the number of columns. And in a square matrix, it's also, of course, equal to the number of rows. And that just means that every column is linearly independent. If a matrix is not full rank, then we sometimes say that it is low rank or rank deficient. 